there's been a great spirit of compassion uh, on one hand. Um, and I, and I, I also like that um, some cities and counties are really trying to work together. Um, there is a spirit of collaboration out there. So that's how I've seen the impact locally. The food lines have doubled as well for those who come and pick up food, healthy food, when we um, deliver that to our community here in East Palo Alto. And we're now taking food because the homeless don't no longer have jobs, most of them, at least 90% of them, now where they used to be able to buy food themselves, now they don't have that opportunity anymore because that restaurant job they had or whatever they had is now closed down. So now they're starving and, and unsheltered slash homeless. Yep. And we're seeing that uh, across the board. Yule, did you have anything uh, to add in terms of the availability of services uh, in the community? You're pretty dialed in. Yeah, for me, I, I just was making a note. I think one of the biggest things is all the restaurants, hospitality, everything is closed down. The effect from those that are newly experiencing uh, food insecurity or homelessness, even at this point, we're seeing that, again, that the demand for individualized meals, family meals, has grown significantly in the last two to three weeks. And anticipating what's coming next in the next week to two weeks, the infrastructure, all the nonprofits that I work with, we're banding together, just trying to put together a plan of one creation and distribution. So you think of just how that goes with all the restaurants being closed. That food line that was perishable, that was donated prior, has ceased. We had a, a flux of donations, but that has stopped. So with that and the volunteer shortage, those individuals that uh, by all rights are uh, not comfortable coming out into a setting or to volunteer. So that's one of the biggest things and we're being creative in which the way in which we're gaining volunteers and I'll go into a couple more things as we go down the list a little bit. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I did want to highlight the fact that you are taking volunteers. That's um, not the case everywhere. Uh, Rachel, anything to add in terms of the availability of services uh, in your neck of the woods in Sacramento? Yeah, absolutely. I think that both Pastor Baines and Yule touched on really important points um, as this has several layers to it. And the first of that is um, that a lot of the smaller, especially faith-based shelters that we have here in the Sacramento area rely on community volunteers to make those shelters operate and run. And so um, that volunteer base has suddenly evaporated. So what we're seeing here is pretty devastating, and that is that all of the faith-based smaller shelters, um, some that operated on a rotating basis, have shut down, um, have closed their doors, and if they didn't last week, they are this week is will be the last week in operations. Um, so, you know, we know that in Sacramento in 2019, we had over 5,500 people sleeping unsheltered on any given night, and now we're actually seeing a decrease in shelter beds. Um, I think one of the other things that happened immediately was that food distribution stopped, especially food distribution that were hot meals um, for safety concerns for the volunteers and the workers. Um, so that's been something that's, that's definitely made things trickier is access to food, um, access to restrooms, to the library so that one could charge their phone. Um, so just being able to stay in touch with some of our team members has become increasingly difficult as the places that they would normally go to charge their phones have closed. Um, and then I think that, you know, trying to navigate services, services that even if someone had a good handle on what the services were and when they were available before, that can be completely thrown out the window now. Um, so a service that someone has relied on for years might not be open any longer, or might have different hours, um, might have different days of schedule, might have closed and are now trying to reopen, but getting that word out there, disseminating the information has become incredibly difficult. So there's a, a whole new landscape to try and navigate just to meet daily living needs. And it's hard when we can't be uh, meet with our folks in the case of Downtown Streets team on a weekly or daily basis to even get that information out. Thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. um, which gets us to, to Joe Yu, I think um, you're probably the best person to tell us, um, what is it like out there? What are the services that you rely on that you need that you're not getting right now? Well, like I was telling Rachel and my, tell you guys on the panel, that it, it was easy for me to get charged up and, and, and areas like the library was the first place it shut down. And that was a resource for myself and for everybody I knew who are homeless. And the food, uh, giving out food, it's it cut down in the area where I stay at by the mission. 
but they're doing their best to get the the food and the and the sanitizer and cleaning uh, water and soap to us. But um, yeah, from my point of view, in my my situation is pretty hard because I have to re reschedule everything. I'm, I'm, I'm where where I'm gonna go find where I'm gonna charge. Yeah, what are what are you feeling out there now? What what's different right now? Right now, like I was telling Rachel, I I get up in the morning at four thirty in the morning to go to go to work, but now I get up so early. Still, I still go do um, I go uh, shower up at uh, Low and Fishes. That's the only place that it's open right now that I know that I've been going to for the longest. And uh, the guest house they give you a, a certain limit to be in certain people to be in their building. As soon as you charge up, you have to leave. You know, things like that, it, it, it does bother me. And I, it bothers because other people that they tell me about it, it's hard being out here. Well, I'm, I'm sensing that you're very appreciative of the services that have uh, remained open. I have technical difficulties. I, I'm sorry, I missed that. Pastor Baines? Okay, well, let me ask you this. Um, you, you, you are a pretty connected guy, Joe. You talk to a lot of folks. You try and help out a lot of folks. How are people feeling um, with nothing to do during the day and no services and nowhere to go to the bathroom? What is their sense? What's they, the sense out on the street? I, I see them in the morning at Lillian Fishes. Um, people that I know where I work at, area that I, that I work at, they say, they tell me how I'm doing and how they're doing and what's going on. Is there any kind of services that I know about? I go, if I do, I'll, I'll let you know. But it's the same uh, information they have, they tell me. Uh, I do miss them. They're like family to me and to my group, to my crew. We all know each other and we get along. That's the only thing that is hurting us. It's hurting me because I don't see my friends daily. I check up on them. I'm the type of person. I will check up on you and if you need a bag or you need some help. I got myself to provide for them or the team. You know, they miss them, our company. I bet. I bet. Um, I think we're all feeling that to some degree. But um, if you, well, it leads, it's a good uh, segue to my next quest, question, which is how are you practicing social distancing or just how are you staying safe while, while living outside? Well, I respect that. The rule, I'm not gonna say it long. It's the rule they they gave us here in the city of Sacramento. Our distance, I respect that, but I don't associate too many big crowds. I'm gonna like by myself. Sometimes I have my some of my workers around me, but we keep our distance. You know, we try to keep positive in this situation because I see that it's taking out a tone to other people. You know, as soon as they get their money, they gotta don't worry about it because they're gonna be on dope. And that's what hurts me. Cause those are some of them who really I talk to. I try to take them off drugs and stuff like that. But this situation is going on and it's it's hurting everybody. Yeah. Well, uh I appreciate um, you know, none of us do this work for the pat on the back, but um, it's great to hear, um, and I want to take this opportunity to appreciate uh, some of the folks I see on the video uh, that we've worked with. Um, so Marie uh, Bernard from Sunnyvale Community Services and Jill Allen from Dorothy's Place, thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, this is, we all know this is really tough right now. Um, another good segue, uh, and we'll start with you, Yule. Um, how have you had to adjust your own operations, and what is it like since we, since we, since this hit? since shelter in place happened. And since I know every time I walk in your building nowadays, you make me sign in and, and take my temperature. Uh, but I imagine it's a lot more complex than that. How has this affected your day to day? So the biggest change, obviously we, we rescue food. So we take perishable food items and we're a conduit to the, the nonprofits. We've had to completely change what we do. It was the first week that came in, we had more donations than we've seen yet. Then we saw from the hotels, restaurants as they shut down, the distributors, Cisco, Edward Don, Fresh Point had product that they purchased for 
the hospitality industry. So now we have other large surge. However, the need now is production of meals. We have never been a producer. Now we're producing five to 10,000 meals a day. We're doing individual meals, we're doing family meals and huge demands as everyone on this call I'm sure knows for the sack meals or the grocery items. Um, as far as how it is affected, the safety protocol, and, and you've seen where you walk into our kitchen, there's a big stop sign, there's rope and stanchion. As you come into the door, they're six feet apart for every individual that's entering. We take their temperature, we have a sign-in law, we have a wash station, gloves, apron, uh, hairnet, and mask mandatory for anybody that comes in. And again, when you're looking at a, a large commissary kitchen and you're practicing social distancing of six feet apart, uh, it makes it just unique in the fact of your operation has to be so careful. And we, we want to, and we are the entity that can provide safe meals. Some are medically sensitive, but our brothers and sisters that are suffering and are hurting, and there's so many. And we're getting to where I had over 250 requests today for meals. And as we continue to produce those, I think it's really important to understand we were a conduit of surplus. Now we're a production agency. And think of Hunger at Home, the Fairmont, Levi Stadium, Oracle Stadium. We have eight executive chefs that are in the kitchen right now mass producing safe meals. And that's our new mission. And we've all changed what we do, what we thought, what we knew before. And as we go into this new time, it's evolving. So as we continue to look at the need, we're ready to scale up. We have four other kitchens ready to go into and embrace and to create that same guideline. So from the safety, from what we're having to do, from we're, we're finding ourselves purchasing a lot of ready-made meals versus preparation, so it's, it's more safe, right? We're practicing safety, less hands are touching it. Um, and that's just the beginning. You think of every phase, every aspect, volunteers, the obviously availability of volunteers with food handlers cards. Mask is the only product that we've had difficulty and community at large has stepped up. I had three people bring uh, boxes of 50 masks today, which was great. But otherwise we're finding the supply, certainly the big uh, distributors have, have products still. So we haven't seen a shortage on, on protein or produce. And this is, um, this is a time where we are going to, you know, in the, the series where we're gonna really focus in on the effect on nonprofits for those that don't, um, you know, work in a uh, leadership capacity in nonprofits. What has that in uncertainty that's out there right now been like as an organization? It is very tough as a nonprofit executive, especially your, um, you know, a smaller, newer nonprofit. Um, what's it like not knowing, you know, who's going to keep the lights on next month and, and how that's going to work? It's a great question. I mean, think of our, our capacity as we go, our volume is a million meals a year, right? So we do a million meals. All of the grants that were pending have been put on hold. So 100%, literally everyone that has been in the hopper has ceased. Uh, our, our annual gala is in question. It's scheduled in October, and, and I can't imagine. Um, we haven't made the decision yet, but obviously that's going to affect and most likely may not happen. So you look at the funding, you look at the availability, you look at what we were programs that we had that were engaged and instituted, ready to begin uh, throughout this year, all been put on hold as the whole planet. Obviously, everyone is suffering. So uh, the money, the, the grants, the availability, and the programs. And obviously, with the hospitality at large shut down, um, we, have to, we had to reinvent ourselves. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Baines, can you talk a little bit about the effect uh, that it's had on the organizations that you run? I think we may have lost Pastor Baines, at least. I'm um, with you, Chris. Okay. Um, okay, I'll, I'll uh, put it over to you, Rachel, then. Um, you know, I think uh, I'm obviously pretty close to the, the, the downtown street scene mission and model. Um, and what one thing that you've said, Yule, that really resonates is having to adjust and recreate how you, um, how you do things. Um, downtown street scene is a model that's so based in social connectedness um, and bringing people together every single t day and building these teams. Um, and it's impossible to do safely in the same way um, while also practicing safety and social distancing. Um, so to you, Rachel, can you tell me a little bit more about, uh, you know, how we've had to adjust as an organization? 
Absolutely. I mean, I think that in every community, you know, in all 15 communities that we're in, it's really a grassroots movement, which means that, um, you know, we're out in the community. That's the core of what we are doing, not only staff, but absolutely our team members are out every day, beautifying the community, conducting outreach, connecting with individuals um, who are in need of services. And that really had to come to a screeching halt in some ways. Um, our community beautification operations ended a couple of weeks ago, or were suspended a couple of weeks ago. Um, and obviously now it looks like through the end of April. So I think that Joe touched on, um, you know, on a lot of what that means to our team members, um, the lack of, of connectedness that they are um, feeling because they're not getting up in the morning and, um, you know, connecting with this family that we've created. So that's been really difficult for us. The things that we, um, you know, are still doing is making sure to check in with our team members, uh, making sure that they have what they need to stay charged, that they have access to basic needs, um, continuing to connect with our team members on a weekly basis um, to distribute the basic needs, stipends to move folks into shelter where that is an option if it is an option. Um, up here in Sacramento, it's, it's been really tricky to navigate services and what we can do. But one thing we can and will always do is stay connected to our team members. So um, whether that looks like a phone call or posting messages onto our, um, you know, storage locations where the teams would normally meet to say, hey, we're thinking about you, you know, maybe here's a crossword puzzle or um, a new resource that we just learned about and we want to make sure that you know about it as well. Um, but it's really, I think it's taking a toll on team members and on staff. Um, one of the, the things that has been really special as a staff person working with this organization and model is that we really care about our team members and that face-to-face -face time is invaluable for us. Um, and so we're learning new ways of how we can create that when we cannot be face-to-face. Um, of how we can show someone that we care about them and continue case management and job search um, and all of those things in a really new and different way. So it's meaning um, staying very fluid and adaptable and um, really being ready at a moment's notice to get information and resources to our team members um, when we don't have a central way to do that. Yeah, we've had to be... Uh... Uh, very flexible, that's for sure. Uh, and then I got word that um, it was actually probably my fault that we couldn't hear Pastor Baines. Um, and he was trying to unmute himself while I was trying to unmute him too. And, and so, Pastor Baines, are you there? Are you with us now? Yeah, I there can you. hear you. We can hear you now too, and we can see you. Hear me? Um, yeah, um, okay. we can hear you and see you. Uh, so let me, let me ask you. Um, so you want me to respond to your question? Yeah, please. How have you had to be flexible? What, what have you had to change? Um, maybe, you know, you and I have had conversations about the toll this has taken on us um, as individuals, um, but on your staff in general, how is this, um, uh, this adjusting and this crisis affected uh, your organizations? Well, I, I, I want to answer your first question when uh, I was muted there about the, the in financial impact. Um, we had a, a fundraiser event scheduled for last week where we had uh, mayors and council people to be there. Um, and we had to cancel that like many other people, obviously, and that was supposed to be about $100,000, $150,000 fundraiser. So, you know, where does that money come from? Um, but I want to say if there's organizations online that there are uh, funding sources, COVID-19 funding sources, San Francisco Foundation, uh, Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Uh, those are areas that they have funds out there for nonprofits that are uh, doing the work that many of us are probably doing that's on the Zoom call. Um, but still, is it going to make up the $150,000? We don't know. Um, um, but it's impacted uh, me, uh, obviously, personally. Um, as a pastor, we're supposed to have a Sabbath day, and I haven't had a Sabbath day in at least five or six weeks. <laughs> Um, we've been working 14, sometimes 16 hour days just because of the mm -hmm. demand for services are, is so great. Um, for, and, and, and when you don't have resources for the homeless, that means other nonprofits, other people have to step up and that gets to be a little taxing, um, uh, because we're engaged and involved in so many different meetings with county people, 
but also we got to meet the needs of the people who need it and not be in so many meetings. Um, but unfortunately, we have to coordinate services. So there is a need there. Um, but also, Chris, if I could I get 30 more seconds here. Um, one of the issues that we are running into is that, you know, gloves. We're going to be out of gloves uh, probably next week if we don't get a supply in. Thankfully, right before this call, one of my members knows somebody that might be able to get us some gloves. Um, and as I have shared with you, Chris, you know, we ordered 30,000 masks to be provided to the other shelters, including Downtown Streets Team and, and Second Harvest and some health facilities because the government is failing us. The government is not producing or they're not producing in the time that they say they're going to produce. I'm talking about local, national, state, <laughs> county. Uh, I've, I've been on all kind of lists. I have not seen any resources come my way <clears throat> yet. Um, so that's also a little bit frustrating uh, when it comes to gloves, disinfectants, and things of that nature. So we have our first how you can help if you feel like uh, taking a trip to see Pastor Baines in East Palo Alto and you have any extra gloves, uh, that's it, beat me to the punch. Um, let me ask you, uh, Joe, I think one of, uh, one of the things we're trying to build here is a sense of empathy and connectedness. Um, and despite how hard that is, given the circumstances, what's one thing you wish you could tell people that don't know a lot about the experience of homelessness don't know um, people that are uh, living on the streets. What's one thing you wish you could tell them about what people are going through and what people are are like? Maybe some things that they believe that just aren't true, or things that you don't see it, it, with the folks that you experience on the streets. Sure, I was telling Rachel. She had to type it up for me because I forget. Uh, I don't want to disrespect nobody in, in the panel. You have to be there to believe what's going on, to be homeless. I, I set up my tent and people go by, you know, like they don't care. You know, they got their own life, the situation that we're going through. And there's people who drive by who really care because it's not only me and my neighbors, we're all different races. You know, it's all mixed out here. And I mean, there's a lot of people who really care, a lot of people don't care. You have to see it, like I said, to believe it. And uh, I know having good things in the situation that I'm in, I know how to own a house, cut my grass, water the grass. I have two cars back home in prison. But in the situation that I'm in, I understand part of life that I'm living in right now, you know, being homeless. And it's hard for, to find out resources, you know, everything has changed. Not only myself, other, my neighbors. You know. It's hard for them because they come and ask me how they can do with it. And I tell them how to do it. Just be positive. It's just, it is hard what they say, I believe it, but you have to understand it. We have to go through it. Not only us, all of us as together. Um, I have, I see people like I said earlier, you know, they don't understand the problem of homeless in Sacramento. Where I come from, homeless is a problem. In Fresno, by living here for the last three years, it's really hard. The problem that the city has, and I hear that they have resources, but I don't see that resources reaching out to people or myself because I'm in the street. I hear from other some other person say, "Well, they're they're passing out information, blah blah blah," but. I want to see it my own eyes. I want, if they have time to come to our area to give us information about the crisis we're going through, they want to put us in housing, emergency housing, like they call it, like they say. Joe, let me ask you this. Um, you know, first of all, you're right. I mean, 
for those that have never experienced it and those that aren't experiencing, especially this unique uh, form of isolation and, um, and that's isolation from um, each other and services um, and social interactions, uh, this is so unique. And unless you've lived through it, you can't really speak to it in the same way which is why you know, we asked you to, to come today with Rachel and, and why we wanted to share your perspective. Um, but let me reframe the question. What is, you know, when you see people maybe that drive by and they just see your tent, um, what's something they don't know about the guy that's living in that tent? What, what's something they don't know about Joe um, that may change the way that they think about people that have experienced homelessness? When they drive by and see me, like they're judging me. and that's the only thing I dislike of somebody looking at me by judging me, by looking at me. They don't stop and say, hey man, are you okay? You need anything. That would change my thought towards that person going by. Like he has everything in the world. But if I take your car, let me put it in an example. If somebody takes your car, you're not gonna be happy. You're gonna be living out here. Or somebody burn your house, you're gonna be out here too. You're gonna be homeless. If your family cannot help you, you know what I mean? Some people might turn back and say, well, I'm going to work. What should I do? And it's kind of a problem that we have, you know. But you have things what God gives you, but God could take it away from you. You know, this the, these, these people who go by act like they got nice lives, but nothing can, can hurt them. But other people go by and they really care. They stop. They ask if they need blankets or, or, or sweaters, jackets. When it was cold, we had people lined up. We were the first ones because they come off the freeway. Back up by McDonald's where I stay at the mission. We're the first ones. I provide for myself. I get it from the mission. I know the stop there. I'm okay. My tent looks like one of the tents it looks like in the movies, like in the desert. It's all nice inside, like that, from India or South, South Arabia tent. You know, it's nice, you know. Yeah. But other, other people who have their tents, they can't. You know, it's hard for them to live in a tent. One thing that I wish everyone knew about Joe is that um, Joe is someone who has gone out into um, the area that, that he takes his crew to clean. Um, Monday through Friday and absolutely created community. Everybody there asks for Joe. They're missing Joe. Um, they know that Joe is the person that they can come and find if they are in need of something, if they need help with anything. Everyone knows to come to Joe because he will help no matter what. And it's something that I really admire about Joe. It sounds like a future case manager to me, um, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself maybe. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for that, Joe. And I don't know if you're um, able to see, we will have this recorded, but you've got some folks cheering you on and thanking you for, for speaking up today. Thank you, man. Uh, Thank you. I love, I'd like to say something to the panel. We, we're in the situation and what we do, we do it best for everybody. And people out there, it's homeless, like providing food, uh, health, uh, provide, uh, issues, you know, like sanitizer, water. I love all you guys. What will you do? What we're going through as a team, as a family. And we love you too, Joe. That's an important message. Ideas. That's an important message that we are all, we all are in this together. Yep. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. So um, let me uh, finish up our questions and then we'll get to Q&A with this last question. Um, which really shines a light on the need and the, the struggle I think that we're all going through and, and maybe can um, help with uh, brainstorming um, outside of our sometimes very siloed existences. Um, I'll start with, uh, let's start with you, Rachel. Um, so assuming the current circumstances and um, you know, COVID-19, uh, coronavirus uh, shelter in place, um, doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. What is the one thing you wish you could do that you currently can't? Um, and I know there's, I've talked to you about this. I'm sure there's a list of like 20 or 30, but if you had to pick one, what's the one thing you wish you had at your disposal or wish you could do um, to help folks that are experiencing this acutely on the streets? Um, I think the one thing that I'm wishing for right now is more information. 
um, on resources to get our folks inside, our folks um, like Joe who are still currently outside, um, what, what that referral process looks like, what that whole process looks like so that we could disseminate that information and start moving folks um, into shelter beds. Um, you know, and then I think the one thing that I, you know, can't safely make happen now, um, I think that all of us, staff, team members, everyone, we are just deeply missing our weekly team meetings um, and just that ability to get together as a family, um, to sing happy birthday, to check in, to see, you know, who's doing well, who needs extra support, um, to break bread together. That's something that um, is taking a huge toll on, on everyone um, at DST. So that's the thing that I'm most looking forward to getting back to. And in the meantime, um, information on how to get folks inside from, you know, from our government up here is really what I'm longing for. Uh, Pastor Baines, uh, what's the one thing you wish you could do uh, that you can't currently? Provide tests for the homeless brothers and sisters because then we could direct resources um, and get those people the help that they need before they die on the street. Yes, sir. Yule, you're up. Well, <clears throat> I think the big one is to create awareness. It just seems that our brothers and sisters, as we know, there's such a lack of infrastructure and to have truly the community get together and to support all those in need, those that have in some way become invisible, visible. Um, it's the resources are there and those that have so much and those that have so little and to try to, to bridge that gap, truly to bridge that gap and to create an awareness amongst our community of what it's like to experience homelessness. And I know in, in my world, so many are, are less than a paycheck away from being homeless that are joining, um, and will soon be. And, and if we don't stop immediately to support every one of our brothers and sisters and provide love, uh, shelter, and substance, um, we're in trouble. That was a couple things, but really awareness, love, and support. So we have to thank everybody, obviously, uh, again, for, for joining us today, because that's what, exactly what we're trying to do is build awareness and understanding. Um, for now, um, I think uh, we're, we should open it up for Q&A uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, and we'll, we'll do what we can before wrapping up and talking a little bit about uh, ways we've established to help out. Um, I have from uh, Terry Cannon, I'd like to better understand what services exist within the Bay Area for the homeless to access metal, medical attention if and when needed. Any of our panelists want to take this on? what services exist within the Bay Area for the homeless to access medical attention if and when needed? Um, well, we work in four different counties and uh, we, we try to partner. Um, something I, I, I got from Chris and, and Eileen years ago, do what you do best and partner for the rest. <laughs> um, we partner with the outreach team. We host the outreach team for San Mateo County um, here at We Hope Shelter, where we bring all the resources together, uh, behavioral health, uh, even the police department, uh, and various other entities that touch our homeless brothers and sisters. And so um, that is one area that I see um, uh, where there could be a synergistic approach you know, to address these systemic issues that our homeless and brothers and sisters are facing. Um, the Valley Medical System, Ravenswood Family Health Center in the Bay Area, and I'm sure every county has their health centers. So I would I would call 211 uh, as a number that you can call from anywhere to get plugged in to what are those local health uh, centers for that particular area, that particular zip code. Uh, that would be my response. Anybody else want to chime in? And uh, as a reminder, if you have any questions, they're starting to pour in now. Um, please use the chat box. But anybody else want to chime in on that specific one? A lot of specific counties have um, medical clinics and new spots that are popping up listed on the county website. 
Um, some of them are also offering specifically um, outreach nurses and spots that they will be um, for folks who are currently living on the street or unsheltered. So checking the county website might be a good resource for that as well. And um, there are limitations like there are for uh, the nonprofits represented here as well. Um, and there's, as we all know, not enough tests um, to go around. Um, so, uh, you know, as per usual, the folks with the least um, are, are have the least access to services. Uh, sometimes when we interact with folks and, and um, Pastor Baines runs, you know, shower programs all over the Bay Area, we either run or help out with a couple shower programs. Um, that's oftentimes the only place in a mobile shower program where we even get to interact with folks. So you can imagine the folks that are sick out there. Um, it is incredibly tough uh, to get them to medical treatment on any given day. Um, and a lot of times the only, the solution is to call an ambulance, which is certainly uh, an expensive uh, intervention, but sometimes uh, the only option we're left with. Um, I'm going to butcher this, so I apologize ahead of time. Aishi, um, E-I-S-H-I-I -I asks, uh, what are some asks from the city and county uh, on how we can better support the operation of CBOs or community-based organizations? What are some better outreach strategies to understand, uh, or excuse me, to reach unhoused folks in this current climate. Anybody want to take that one on? Say that one more time, Chris. Sure. Yeah, it kind of wrapped up with, yeah. What are some better outreach strategies to reach unhoused people in the current climate? Well, I'll say what works with us is, you know, we have like nine case managers that go out to the homeless encampments. They sometimes go along with our mobile homeless services, uh, whether that's the Hope Health Medical Vehicle or the Dignity you know, Wheels trucks. And um, they, they, they are there, they know the needs of our homeless brothers and sisters that they're talking to. They built up a relationship to where they're considered to be a trusted source. Um, and after we've built up that relationship, then we're able to um, really connect them to on ramps that get them into housing. Our, our mission is about um, getting them healthy, getting them employed, and getting them housed. That's our mission of We Hope. So if we're not doing that, then we're doing, we feel we're doing our clients a disservice. And that's what works for us, at least. And that actually goes along um, uh, with something that uh, it uh, looks like Jasmine Abdul Karim has asked. Um, specifically to downtown streets team asking us if we're in operation. Um, right now we're very much in operation. We're providing um, case management, employment services, and um, uh, connecting with our folks on a daily basis, but our teams are not out there cleaning. Um, and that's specifically, we made that decision and um, stopped uh, all of our work experience contracts um, on March 9th, uh, specifically to keep our folks safe. Um, you know, as you can imagine, that's uh, decision we feel really good about because uh, even more so than our, um, you know, inflows, uh, our team members are our number one concern. Um, Jocelyn, a partner of ours, hi Jocelyn, uh, has uh, asked uh, privately to me, but she asked, um, are there any efforts that you know of to make temporary housing into permanent solutions? And I'll, I'll ask the panel if anybody wants to jump in there. Pastor Baines, you, you're laughing, so I think you have to answer that one first. Um, yeah, I, I, that's funny. Um, so there's something else that we are working on. Um, it's, it's people of We Hope, but it's not We Hope organization where we are, are going to be partnering and building a manufacturing plant that will specifically target 30% AMI folks. That is the working poor and that is the homeless. And our goal is to produce about a thousand homes but only for 30% AMI folks. This is not for market rate or anything like that. Um, and we plan to have the factory up and running this time next year. And we already have the land and we're raising the capital now. So that's what we're doing. We think that that will make a significant dent in the housing market for 30% AMI folks. And this is in a partnership with uh, CZI and Silicon Valley uh, Community Foundation. And it will be in a, uh, an opportunity zone as well. Chris, can I jump in on this question a little as well? Because I think it's- Sure, we are running out of time, so I'm gonna ask you to be brief. 
Oh, okay, got it. I will be very brief then. Um, I, I just want to say that I think it's interesting the effect that this is having on kind of the plans for affordable housing and shelter in each community and every community does look different. Um, but I know one of the things in Sacramento is that two sites that were um, you know, in the process, going to have shelters, um, 100 plus bed shelters in the coming months, those sites have now been designated for emergency shelter. And so the long term planning of what does the old shelter plan look like when now this new shelter plan that you know needs to come up faster and what are the long-term effects of that um, is something that's going to look really interesting in the coming years even after uh, after a lot of what we're feeling right now has subsided with COVID. Um, I think that it's, it's creating a different landscape for what housing looks like and what shelter looks like in each community. Okay. And then, um, you know, we have had a couple really great uh, questions here. We're going to try and address those um, offline if we can and respect everybody's time. Um, I will say, Erica, if you can pop, uh, go back into our slideshow. Uh, thank you here. Um, and thank you for your questions. We knew we, we would have more questions than we could possibly answer um, on, in this format. Um, we'll try to do that and certainly incorporate a lot of these questions as well into our next series, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, the, the question we get more than ever from folks reaching out to us from uh, supporters, donors, um, folks we work with is, you know, how can I help? Um, and there are, there are things you can still do. This, uh, this crisis has really changed the way that we help out, um, whether it's uh, nonprofits or direct one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but there's still a couple of things that we can do to be pretty effective. First and foremost, one of the things we say at Downtown Streets team always is just say hi. Um, really connecting people and removing that stigma of that that social social isolation that people feel, um, and including them, um, and and quite frankly, um, treating them like a person rather than part of the sidewalk, uh, is so incredibly important. We're sending around this slide deck afterwards, um, but there's a YouTube link here. You could also type in downtown street scene. Just say hi. It's a, about a two minute video that really goes into this philosophy about um, uh, what this means, and I won't dwell on it much more, but. Um, really more than ever, one of the silver linings here is that we're all treating each other, I think, um, at least I'm seeing it, a lot of us are treating each other a little bit better these days. Um, and certainly the folks here that have joined us today want to build this empathy and want to want to build this community. And one of the themes I'm seeing from what we've talked about is kind of we are in this together and we are a family. Um, also, with just say, say hi, it helps to facilitate these interactions um, with giving out something that someone may need. So I always carry in my car um, a pair of socks with a little downtown streets team, here's your local team um, uh, card on it. Uh, a lot of the things that people need are the, the, the things that are um, out at the grocery store, toilet paper, gloves, masks. If you have extras, send the gloves to Pastor Baines. Uh, if you have even more, uh, carry them around in your um, glove compartment. It's really hard to stay six feet away too. So, you know, I've been driving with gloves in case interacting with folks that are experiencing homelessness. Um, Another thing, obviously, is volunteer. If um, you know you are able to safely do that, and you're not living with medically vulnerable people, um, that's obviously a personal decision. But there are places that are still accepting volunteers. Um, I know uh, Yule from Hunger at Home uh, in San Jose is still looking for volunteers. Uh, if you're able to do that, there is a greater need than ever. Um, there's obviously been a lot talked about the the financial uncertainty that all nonprofits are facing. A lot of times uh, for folks that are able, it's easy just to jump online um, and uh, you know, uh, type in your credit card um, and be able to help in that way as well. I wanna thank everybody who uh, donated. We're splitting the donations that we received today between the organizations here. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty. We're still paying our, our team members um, up to $100 a week in Safeway and CVS so that um, when they're not able to access um, for example, um, the food closet in um, Palo Alto past 3 p.m., uh, they can still get a hot meal. It's incredibly important to provide that stability uh, for nonprofit staffs, but even more importantly, those that we serve. I just recommend that you, you, know, you check in and see if that nonprofit is still serving um, if, if this crisis in particular is close to you. And then maybe even most importantly um, is your ability to advocate. And we live in a world now where you can advocate from your um, office chair or your couch or your bedroom. Um, you can write to um, county, especially county, um, state, and city officials, urging them to include unhoused people when they're considering um, funding for this crisis. Uh, very recently, there was a federal stimulus package, and uh, the National Alliance and Homelessness had an opportunity to identify your um, congressman 
and write to them and say, please consider this. There's going to be a second round of a stimulus package, and we need to make sure that um, our unhoused neighbors are considered. Uh, but you can start at a very hyper-local level, your um, local uh, city council member. They're making decisions um, every single day that affect all of us, and they need to consider those that, that have the lease and aren't able to shelter in place uh, when you advocate. Um, so again, we'll be sending this out, uh, and if you'd like to get involved, please uh, feel free. We'll throw up <coughs> contact information um, at the end. You can reach out to us directly to um, identify specific needs. Erica, if you could go into our, uh, our second to last slide, we did want to invite everybody to our, our next um, event. It's going to be two weeks from today at the same time. I'm particularly excited about this event because Downtown Streets team, quite frankly, was um, founded because of... Uh, uh, this idea that social iso isolation is a major barrier to folks uh, being successful. Um, and it's, you know, uh, our team members have identified it as the absolute worst part about living on the streets, um, surprisingly. Uh, we have uh, Donna Tversky uh, from Stanford, who's incredible, that'll be joining us. Uh, my mother, our founder and CEO, Eileen Richardson, and Romy Nottage, who's our senior director in San Francisco, uh, with a long history, clinical history, to talk about these effects. We'll also be featuring another team member and or graduate. Um, and uh, you'll receive an email with that registration link as well. So if we can go to our last slide um, with our last two minutes, I just wanna thank um, everybody who helped put this together um, and especially our panelists, um, uh, you two, um, especially Pastor Baines and you all are very busy guys. Um, and I really appreciate you coming in and helping us out. Rachel, you're incredible. Um, and I, I don't know what we would do without you. Thank you for your time as well. Joe, you are incredibly brave. Uh, I, I have to send a special thank you to you for joining us today um, amidst everything and for, for being so open and honest about the struggle uh, that you're going through and the way that you're able to do it with, with a smile on your face always um, and always putting others first is uh, incredibly admirable and something we should all um, strive to achieve. Uh, so thank you all very, very much. Um, and with that, uh, you'll be hearing from us soon. Okay. I was just keeping it 100, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us. Blessings.